Thank you, Safina. How are we doing? We good? I was uh, at St. Paul's Cathedral yesterday, and there were, I don't know, I think it was about just under 30 uh, people getting ordained as deacons in the Church of England. Uh, it was an amazing service, and the Bishop of London put out for us Capital Vision 2020, which is this ambitious vision that the Church of England has got at the moment um, to uh, produce 100,000 workplace ambassadors before 2020, to plant 100 new worshipping communities before 2020, to impact our culture before 2020, to impact it for the gospel so that we can see change in this city because of what the church is doing. It's a great time to be church and it's a great time to be in the Church of England, in this bit of God's church. And this morning, we are continuing our series on I Life and uh, we're looking at how to be virtuous in a virtual world, how to live in the way that God wants us to live in the age, the digital age, that Rod reminded us last week uh, that we live in. I've never done a talk before which has had a parental guidance rating, so it'll probably be really good if we pray and ask for God's help, uh, and uh, then we'll get stuck in. Let's pray first. Holy Spirit, we invite you in now. Lord, come down now and be with us as we look at this difficult subject. Holy Spirit, come down now and be at work in our hearts, be at work in our minds and our lives. Holy Spirit, do whatever you need to do in each of us and take my words, bless those that are from you and forgive those that aren't. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Rod reminded us last week that we live in a digital age. We live in a time of faster and faster computers. We live in a time of more and better devices. We live in a time of quicker and quicker streaming internet, faster and faster streaming video communications, instant access to communication and to information. We're immersed in technology, we're hyper-connected to more people than we've ever been before. We can buy stuff from millions of online companies at the click of a button, and we can talk to people on the other side of the world. I was talking to someone in Australia just yesterday morning. And the sense is that this is just the beginning of something. The sense is that we are at the beginning of a revolution in the way that we live as human beings. And with this digital age, we find that the things that we want and the things that we desire are being changed. That our desires are coming in line, if you like, with the digital age. We get digital desires. When we want pleasure, we tend to go online. When we want to relax, we often go online. When we want to chill, we often go online. When we want to get entertained, we often go online. And so many people, when they want to play games now, they don't get a board out and play board games, they go online and play online games. When we want to watch films or TV series, we go online and we download or we watch stuff online. When we want to read a book, we go online and we download it. And increasingly, increasingly, when people want to exercise their sexual fantasies, they're doing it online. We're doing it online. So 70% of men are watching porn online. 30% of women are watching porn online. That figure for women is a huge leap in the last 10 years. Most internet searches are for porn. Internet service providers, the, the top five internet service providers, reckon that just over 30% of their total bandwidth is used for downloading or video streaming porn. And the top five porn sites get 450 million unique visitors every month. 450 unique million unique visitors every month. And just for comparison, if you add together Amazon and Twitter 
and Netflix. Those three together have 316 million unique visitors every month. So porn outstrips the three top sites. This is the culture that we live in. This is the cultural air that we breathe. This is the cultural water that we swim in. This is the culture that our church is doing mission in. It's the culture that we're discipling our children in. Digital pornography is an issue for all of us. It's an issue for our church. It's an issue for our families. It's an issue for our children. It's an issue for us. It directly affects many people in this church, many people here this morning. And I just want to say as we start as well, this is an issue which affects me directly. So 10 years ago, Jesus uh, gate crashed my life and, and took me off in a completely unexpected direction. But before that, internet porn was just a part of the background of the way that I lived my life. It was where I went to pursue my sexual fantasies. Uh, lots of my mates did the same. We all regarded it as relatively normal and relatively harmless. I no longer regard it as normal or harmless. And following Jesus for me, meant intentionally turning away from all of that stuff and turning instead towards the plan that Jesus had for my life. Following Jesus meant intentionally saying no to internet porn and saying yes to the plan that Jesus had for me. And the plan that Jesus had for me, he sets out everywhere in Scripture, but in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he makes it really clear that there's only one person one person that I should look at sexually. There's only one person that I should fantasize about sexually, and that is my wife. And I haven't met her yet. If you're here today, introduce yourself at the end of the service. <laughs> <laughs> but as we think about the digital age that we live in, we have to think about this issue of internet porn. And, and as we're thinking about the digital age, we've been uh, looking at, this, uh, uh, at the book of James, We've been looking at the book of James. You might want to open it now and keep it open at chapter 1, uh, at that passage that Safina read. And you might well ask, what has James got to do with digital media? What does James, a first century Jewish Christian, what does he know about internet porn? Well, James is writing under the power of the Holy Spirit. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he's writing a particular type of writing, which is called wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. And wisdom literature in the Bible isn't just wise observations about how things are. Wisdom literature in the Bible is knowing how to live well as God's people. Wisdom literature is knowing how to live well as God's people. So in the digital age, the book of James offers us digital wisdom. James shows us how to live well as God's people in every generation. He shows us how to live well as God's people in every age. He shows us how to live well as God's people today. So we're going to look at James and see what he's got to say to us. And first of all, he says that we need to know how desire works. We need to know how desire works. Verse 14, each of you is tempted when you are dragged away by your own evil desire and enticed. Each of you is tempted when you are dragged away by your own desire and enticed. Your own desire, your own desire, your desires are yours. And that's the first thing is that we need to take responsibility and own this. You know, we, we sin because we desire it, James is saying. We're tempted to sin because we desire it. We're tempted to look at internet porn because we want to. And we need to own that. We need to own that. And that desire can become very strong and very intense. And James says we can be dragged away by it. We can be enticed by it. We can be seduced by it. We can jump into bed with it. It's a sexual metaphor. If the desire is intense enough, we can be dragged off and seduced. What do you do when someone's dragging you off? You shout for help. You shout for help. And that's the first thing that I want to encourage you to do this morning, to shout for help. You know, James isn't talking about what anyone's actually doing at this point. He's saying your desires, your desires, if this is going on in your head, or if you're even thinking about this, ask for help. 
Talk to someone. Find someone that you can talk to. Find someone that you can be accountable to. Find someone that you can say, you know, I'm thinking about this. This pops into my head from time to time. I don't know what to do with it. Pray with me. Help me. Keep me accountable. You can get software on your computer from uh, Covenant Eyes, uh, and Triple X Church, that's XXX Church, uh, and that will basically send a log to someone telling them everything that you've been looking at on your computer. It's a way of asking for help. You know, right at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was tempted. Right at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was tempted, and he was out on his own in the desert, and the only reason we know about it is because he told other, other people. That's the only way we know about it, because he told other people. Jesus doesn't mind telling people that he's tempted, so we shouldn't mind either. James tells us we need to know how desire works. So when you feel it trying to drag you away, when you feel it trying to seduce you, when you feel it trying to get you into bed, you can shout for help, you can expose it, you can bring it out into the open. So I have someone that I talk to once a week. It's just a quick conversation usually about what's going on for me. What am I thinking about? What's, you know, is there anything that's tempting me? I've got covenant eyes on my laptop that sends a log off to uh, Rod Green uh, telling him every single website that I've been looking at. If you think MI5 surveillance is intrusive, that's got nothing on Rod Green. <laughs> but basically it means if I'm getting dragged away and if I feel that I need help, there are people that I can ask for help. Before anything goes wrong, I can ask for help. And this isn't just about us as individuals, is it? Because lots of us here are responsible for children. Uh, and as Rod said, there was one recent study by a clinical psychologists that suggested that the average age of children's first exposure to pornographic images is six. I mean, there are other, there are other studies that suggest that it might be eight. And this is children. I was at my nephew's sports day uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and three children in his class, three boys, have all got iPads. It just takes one child with a smartphone in the playground. And everyone could potentially see stuff that you wouldn't want your children to see. You know, the most common reason that children give for looking at porn is because they want to find out about sex because they want to find out about sex. Well, learning about sex from looking at porn videos is a bit like trying to learn to drive from looking at Fast and Furious 6. It's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster. We need to be teaching our children to come to us for help. We need to be teaching our children to ask us those questions. We need to be discipling our children, not leaving it to school, not leaving it to the guys downstairs on a Sunday. We need to be discipling our children, teaching them safety at school, teaching them safety at their friends' houses, teaching them safety on the internet, teaching them to shout for help when they're dragged away and seduced by desires that maybe they don't understand or know how to make sense of. So James teaches us to know how desire works. And secondly, James teaches us to know where desire leads. Verse 15, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full, full grown, gives birth to death. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So desire drags you away and seduces you and gets you into bed. And there's a pregnancy. And then there's a child and then this child grows up into a monster that nobody wanted. That's what James is saying, because no one signs up to be an internet porn addict. No one signs up to be obsessed with watching porn. No one signs up to have a habit that they can't let go of. That's not where it starts. That's not where it starts. You know, there's research in a, an academic journal in 2010 which analyzed the content of the top 50, that's the top 50 most popular, online porn sites. 88% contained physical aggression. 48% contained verbal aggression. All of it overwhelmingly directed at women. So we get dragged away. We get seduced by something that we want, our desires. And we end up getting something that we never banked on in the first place, that we never wanted. And James calls that death. 
death to real relationships as our brains get trained in specific sexual tastes, as our brains get trained to want new partners every time, as our brains get trained in hatred of women, as our brains get trained in completely unrealistic expectations of men, and for women, this includes erotic novels. You know, on Kindle, the top of, out of the top 20 novels, the, the 11 of those are erotic novels which are aimed specifically at women, training women to fantasize about specific unhealthy relationships. All of this starts with something good. It starts with something that feels good. It starts with something that feels controllable. It starts with something that feels okay. And it ends up in a place that we never wanted to go. And James calls that death. Death to our relationships. Death in our marriages. Death to our families. Death in our friendships in church as we stop being honest with each other about what's going on. Death to the ministries and services in our church as we stop thinking of ourselves as the sort of people who can represent the church because we know that there's all this other stuff going on. And ultimately, this leads to death to our souls. Death to our souls. Someone said recently, the soul tends to shrink to the size and quality of its pleasures. The soul tends to shrink to the size and quality of its pleasures. So if the pleasure that we're pursuing is small and brief and questionable and secret, and selfish, and imaginary. What does that do to the size of our soul? Where does that leave us? It leaves us with a soul, with a capacity which is too small to really enjoy the wide open spaces of God. It's completely destructive of our capacity to come into the presence of God and enjoy all of the blessings that he's got to give us, to get excited about his word, to enjoy the relationships that we can enjoy in church. It's completely destructive of all that. So it starts, desire starts with this intense desire for something. You know, it's just something that we want in our heads and we get dragged away and seduced by it. And this grows there's, there's a child, and the child grows up into a monster breeding death. That's what James says. So James says, know how desire works. It seduces you. And know where desire leads. It leads to death. So what can we do? What can we do? Well, thirdly, we can know who to listen to. We can know who to listen to. Verse 16, James says, don't be deceived, dear brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived, dear brothers and sisters. In Greek, it's don't be deceived, brothers and sisters, who I love. Because James is saying, you're my brothers and sisters, and I love you, and you're being deceived. You're listening to lies. You're being conned. You're being cheated. This is not the truth. That's what he's saying. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. And again, this isn't just about us, it's about our children as well. Teaching our children to know how to recognize lies. You know, so that anything that's put in front of them, anything that's put in front of them on a screen, they know how to ask, where has this come from? What is it promising? Is that true? Where has this come from? What is it promising? Is that true? We need to not listen to lies. We need to not be deceived. We need to listen instead to the truth. And it may be today that you're thinking that there could be some steps that you might want to take back towards the truth. Maybe the lies have just been there for so long that you know they need some real disentangling to move back towards the truth. And there's a, a whole bunch of places that you can go uh, to talk to someone or to get help with that. Triple X Church, XXX Church, again online, have got an online course detoxing people from internet porn. Um, Living Waters is a ministry that lots of people have benefited from uh, here in this church, and you can get in touch with them online. Or you could just talk to us, talk to Rod, talk to Andrew, talk to me, uh, talk to Inga today. 
Know who to listen to. Don't be deceived. And fourthly, James says, know your identity. Know your identity. Verse 18. He, God the Father that is, the Father of lights, God the Father chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. God the Father chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So listen to the truth there about who you are. God the Father gave you birth. If you're following Jesus, God's your father. You're a child of God. That's the truth about who you are. You're not a dog on heat. You're a child of the Father. You know, we need to remind ourselves of this often, reading God's word in the morning, reading God's word in the evening. That's why we read scripture, to remind ourselves who we are. That's one of the reasons we read scripture, to remind ourselves who we are, that we're God's children, that we're his new creation, James says. We need to remind ourselves that we're children of our heavenly father, and that's our identity, that's who we are. And we could pray for a new love, for that father who gave us birth. We could pray for a new love for that father who gave us birth. At the beginning of the 19th century, a uh, Scottish uh, Church of Scotland minister uh, called Thomas Chalmers gave an amazing sermon, uh, which goes by the title, The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And Chalmers says that we can try and stay away from the things that attract us. We can try and push things away that we find attractive but we know are wrong. We can try and change our behavior and all of that's good. But the thing that's going to make the main difference and the thing that's going to have the big impact and the thing that's going to give us real victory is a new love for God. It's a new love for God. Because when you fall in love, when you fall in love with a person, no one else looks attractive anymore. And when you fall in love with Jesus, sin doesn't look attractive anymore. You just want to do anything that pleases Jesus, that makes Jesus happy, that glorifies Jesus, that makes him look good. It's a whole new love for God. And that's what gives us a real victory, makes a real big difference in this issue of internet pornography. Because I've got to be honest, the idea of internet pornography still somewhere attracts me. You know, from time to time, there'll be a little voice going off in my head saying, that's something you could look at, that's something you could follow up, that's something you could see if it's still there from 10 years ago. But around 10 years ago, I fell in love with Jesus. Around 10 years ago, I fell in love with Jesus and my love for him is much, much bigger than that. It's as if there's this kind of like this tasty Big Mac here. I know it's a Big Mac and, you know, that might not be very attractive for some of you, but it's a Big Mac and that can look attractive and it can look tasty. But then over here, there's an entire, you know, Sunday roast banquet and it's kind of, that's Jesus. Why wouldn't I choose that? Because it looks so much better. And every so often there's this little voice in my head that will say, you know, what about the Big Mac? But no, I want this. So yes, I've got safeguards on my computer. Yes, I've got an accountability partner. Yes, I'm careful about when and where and how I use my iPhone and my iPad. But the main deal is that my heart is completely clear. My heart is completely clear. I want to live my life as one of the Father's sons. I want to live my life as the first fruits of the new creation. I want to enjoy the love of God, my Father. I want that much, much more. Know your identity. Know that you're loved. Know that you're a child of God. Know that you're a new creation. Know your identity, James says. And also, finally, know your destiny. Know your destiny. Verse 12. Right at the beginning of this passage, James says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because when they've stood the test, they'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. They'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So know your destiny and know where you're heading. That's where you're heading. The crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. The crown of life 
That's where we're heading. Internet porn, James says, leads to death. In all its forms, it leads to death. Online chat rooms lead to death. Still pictures lead to death. Video images lead to death. It all leads to death. Erotic novels lead to death. But choosing Jesus leads to life. It leads to life, not just any old life, but the fullness of life, a crown of life, a life of victory that we get crowned with. And we will be tested. Blessed is the one who perseveres when they're tested, because when they've stood the test, they'll get the crown of life. We will be tested. Jesus says we'll be tested. Paul says we'll be tested. Peter says we'll be tested. And James says we'll be tested. So don't believe anyone who says that you won't be tested. You'll be tested. And in our sexualized culture, we're surrounded by stuff which will lie to us, which will cheat us, which will con us, which will try and seduce us, which will try and get us to jump into bed with something which will only deliver death. And we have a better offer 